the oligarchy has sort of surpassed the aristocracy in a way because the aristocracy has used the oligarchy to try and propel its standing to a previous era of dominance, which is just really clutching at straws. The British aristocracy. Once upon a time, they ruled the world, pillaging the global south for its resources. But now, after empire, they've turned their extractative, exploitative machine of governance back on the UK. From PPE contracts to austerity measures, our ruling class have robbed the public to enrich elites. But where did that mindset come from? I'm joined by Sam Bright, investigative journalist and author of Bullingdon Club Britain, to find out how the ruling class were made, what they really mean when they talk about rolling in the muck, and how they get away with ransacking the rest of us. Sam Bright, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. Where does your fascination with posh people come from? Um, well, it all comes down to class, doesn't it, really? <laughs> um, I mean, s- taking it right back, sixth form, I was always obsessed with like private schools and the like injustice mm. of people who go to private school and have this elevated education versus everybody else. Um, you know, I went to state schools in the north of England and they were, they were you know, they were great schools, but I sort of grew up with this um, sense of deep unfairness that the education system was rigged um at the get-go um and so yeah I was your typical sort of fist-waving teenager (laughs) in that regard um very angry about you know posh people private schools I remember just before I went to university actually the riot club came out um which was the satirization of the Bullingdon club um which I've watched before I went to kind of prepare myself for seeing people who'd actually gone to private schools for the first time uh, when I went to university. Um, And that, I guess, added fuel to the flames of my sort of, you know, the idea that, um, yeah, I I mean, it broadens beyond private schools, doesn't it? But the whole, you know, whole 360 degrees of British society being rigged in favour of a select few, uh, yeah, just struck me as uh, appalling and, um, yeah. But what was it like when you started encountering people who, came from that background was it exactly as you thought were you like ah the riot club really prepared me for encountering you as a human being or were there things that surprised you um I mean I think it's always more nuanced isn't it than the sort of Hollywood dramatization of these things um so yeah I mean your classic university existence I was forced to make friends with people who'd been to private schools um in the southeast and really got along with them and I think that's that's the thing about the way in which the meritocracy and social mobility um, mindset, the narrative is is sort of harnessed, is that the exceptions are used to prove the rule. So people say, oh, well, you're friends with people who, you know, have grown up in those sort of circumstances. And they don't think that anymore. They're sort of enlightened. And therefore, um, the whole system isn't as bad as you think. Um, and obviously, that's where the narrative falls down because, you know, the majority of kind of people's existence is being smashed by the British class system. Um, And I mean, one thing that struck me about university was kind of a sense of um, apathy, like a a kind of a blithe um, ability to succeed on their part. Like they could just sort of waltz through lectures, like spew out some half-baked thoughts on the material that they'd read two hours the night before. Whereas I was like really studious and I, you know, <laughs> wanted to read everything in detail. I didn't quite understand the sort of linguistic games that you had to play at university. Um, and I guess it's kind of a more subtle form of kind of class disparity that you come into contact with at university. There's a word in Italian for it. It's called sprezzatura. And it's this sort of aristocratic not trying. The idea yeah. that everything comes easily to you. So you don't even have to work at it. Yeah, exactly. And you see that in like Boris Johnson's whole persona is that people like that. We've been taught to like worship this like bumbling, half-hearted fool who can use Latinate words to like impress us. We kind of like that. It's kind of like, you know, the Jeremy Clarkson style of like politics and life as well. Like, oh, I'm not going to try very hard. I'm just going to smash things up and, you know, it'll all be fine and we'll, we'll have a laugh about it and we'll go to the pub afterwards. Like, 
Whereas I was, yeah, I, I don't know, particularly going to a, a Northern university, um, I felt as though there was kind of like a lack of um, kind of cultural and geographic understanding. From what was the uni that you went to? York. So you went to York and did you just feel that there were a load of people who'd like decamped from their sort of, you know, golden stoned public schools, private schools, and then suddenly they're up north and they're not engaging with the place that's around them? Completely. I saw it as like um, a hideaway for them for a few years to kind of trash a northern city, then go back home and, you know, get a job at a consultancy or a law firm or something like that, rather than really... I mean, there were a few people who did embed themselves, you know, in the place, but I'd say the majority um, kind of showed a, a willful ignorance towards the place. How did it manifest? Um, I mean, it was it was just like a lack of engagement with the culture of the place. I kind of like, I mean, I'm, I'm as you know, Ash, I'm quite sort of um, chest thumping northerner. We'll so get onto that, we'll don't get worry. We'll get onto that, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, maybe I shoved it down people's throats too much, but it was kind of like a flippancy towards, you know, me trying to talk about those sort of things or, you know, just kind of like a, a lack of seriousness towards appreciating like, certain values a general kind of like i wouldn't say disdain but like certainly bordering on disdain towards the like staff at the university who are the only ones that had like northern accents (laughs) who came from the place um and like i don't know it's sort of the forming of social camps in a way you kind of had the you know all of the the northerners keeping together and then everyone else um, doing their own thing. So it was kind of, it was subtle. I mean, I write in the first book in Fortress London, um, I interview a few people from Durham University because I was struck by the fact that Durham has both a Northern society and a working class society at a Northern university. It's like you kind of form societies either to have an excuse to go drinking or because you're some sort of like marginalized group and you need to stick together. Um, and so I was like perplexed that they needed a Northern society. Um, and the experiences at Durham from the people I spoke to were like a million times worse than the ones that I'd gone through, um, where, um, there was a common term used, which was rolling in the muck, which was, um, the term for sleeping with a Northern working class person. Yeah. You know, the classic Bullingdon club tactics of like burning money in front of poor people, um, yeah. Or like really just like nasty social bullying and prejudice um at like a university that's based in a former mining region just seems like totally bizarre and i think that sort of shows how um yeah that seeped into our our society i mean hearing you tell these stories it it makes me think about my experience at university because i went to ucl which is based in london and i grew up in london but suddenly the london i was encountering at ucl was so different from the london that i knew you're encountering people who went to private schools, public schools. I remember going to someone's house party going, oh my God, this place is amazing. How much is the rent? And then someone's like, she's not renting this. Her parents bought it for her. And I was like, oh. Um, But the thing which always really got to me is that I felt like I was taking things too seriously and everyone else was playing this game that I didn't know the rules for. And in um, my freshers week, I encountered this guy who quite a bit posher than me, had gone to a private school. And he really wanted to talk to me about Enoch Powell. And he really wanted to talk to me about why Enoch Powell was so great. And I was like, I am not going to share this opinion with you for very obvious reasons. Then he was like, no, 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 no. Common misconception. Enoch Powell wasn't racist. Those were just his stupid working class followers. And I remember just sitting there and I was like, if you'd said this in the area of North London where I grew up, someone would just kick the shit out of you. And sure, that's maybe not morally good and maybe that's not erudite and it's not upholding the values of reason debate but at least rough justice would teach you where the line is and I felt like I was encountering people who who never had to live with any line yeah. whatsoever yeah yeah it's like the snobbery and the yobbery of the aristocracy like this whole idea and obviously I mean Jones puts it very well in Chavs this whole idea that the aristocracy and the middle class don't have kind of um, brutal values or, you know, the the worst excesses of them don't have those values, whereas they do. Like the way in which they express themselves to the people that they believe to be their social inferiors 
is cutting and it's devastating and it comes from a position of power which makes it all the more more dangerous um and we just we don't have i don't i don't think we don't have a way of like explaining that or of like figuring out how that manifests in british society we actually revel in it we like to see aris it's it's like one of our best exports aristocracy like it's a shame that we've been encouraged down this line and i think it's only getting worse to some extent and part of that is you know ye old um the the ye old aristocrats who you know had servants and slaves and you know were behaved appallingly towards their social inferiors and i think to a large degree um we've kind of bought the myth of aristocracy um and at the same time bought its worst aspects and have kind of internalized them we haven't taught or we don't have a method of kind of um creating a form of benevolent aristocracy anymore even if that was the case but i think the aristocracy has actually got more brutal in time rather than less um and obviously it's touched upon in the book but you know largely because it's it's been able to use the instruments of neoliberalism to um you know to punish all those in its path really i mean you describe as you put it the combination of snobbery and yobbery in the bullingdon club so some of the people who will be watching this might not be from the uk they might not have heard of the bullingdon club um what is it and what's so fucked up about it the Bullion Club is it actually started as a cricket club and then merged into a drinking society. So, you know, common story throughout. Sports Britain. and drinking. So sports never and drinking. never heard of that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um was founded in the 18th century. Um and it's basically just like an elitist society for people to get drunk and behave appallingly. Um, specifically at the University of Oxford. Um, its members are drawn from the top private schools in the country, um, predominantly Eton, Harrow and Westminster. Um, George Osborne, um, our beloved former chancellor, um, was a member of the Bullingdon Club. Um, he went to St. Paul's, um, which is not one of the... Oh, what a peasant. Is that, he was literally called an oik because he went to St. Paul's. Um, so, and basically they go around um, trash restaurants um, and leave a healthy ward of cash on the table as sort of a, a sorry note. Um, we actually <laughs> managed to convince a former Bullingdon Club member to write the foreword to the book, um, John Mitchinson, which I think is probably one of the longest pieces written about the Bullingdon Club from a former Bullingdon Club member. How did you get him to do it? He's just like, I mean, for one thing, he thinks he's the only state-schooled Bullingdon Club member in history. So he is from the UK, but he went to school in New Zealand. Um, and so <laughs> this kind of shows the stupidity of the aristocracy to some extent as well. So when they came back, when he came back to the UK and went to Oxford, they're all confused about which school he went to. Um, and they probably thought it was way more exotic than it actually was. Um, and he says that uh, he claims he was great at throwing parties. And so he was a natural member of the Bullingdon Club. So they just accepted him in. Um, but his, his, stories are, his stories are great. He tells of... Um, you know, his initiation ritual, which was he was woken up in the middle of the night, his room was trashed, uh, champagne was sprayed everywhere, and then it was a night of debauchery from then onwards. So kind of the stereotypical things that you, you, like everyone associates with the Bullingdon Club happened to him. Like this isn't just like, like I said, this isn't just Hollywood. It actually happened like this. And he tells a story as well of um, what left him to part um, what led him to part the Bullingdon Club, which was he was having dinner in his third year in a in a bar in Oxford, um, you know, just a normal place. And a Bullingdon Club member came in, um, ordered a bottle of port, um, took it to the gents, brought it back a few minutes ago and said to the waitress, oh, the port's off. Um, she said, oh, you know, I'm so sorry, I'll, I'll replace it for you. She came back a few minutes later and said, uh, you people are the worst human beings that I've ever come across because he pissed in the port. Yeah. And so John thought at that stage, yeah, this isn't the sort of place for me. I mean, it paints a portrait of, you know, in right-wing newspapers, you often hear about the feckless poor, right? So people who are, you know, 
ill-mannered, who are destructive, who don't take any sense of personal responsibility. That's always been the caricature of a certain kind of working class person. But this is a portrait of the feckless rich, so wasteful and cruel and violent. I mean, does the Bullingdon Club invent those values for that class of people or does it start much earlier on? I think it sort of the sharp end of the spear, you know, I think, um, you know, I do a, a chapter on Eton um, in the book. Um, and I think those sort of private schools do train these people to think that they have a special status in society. Um, you know, famously Eton and, you know, lots of other exclusive private schools they are built with hierarchies in mind. They have prefix systems. Famously, the one in Eton is called POP, which Boris Johnson was a part of. You know, the head boy and head girl systems, which have been adopted by the state, you know, the state school system, um, are actually designed in private schools to um, imbue this sense of hierarchy and of some people being more deserving than others. On top of having histories of, you know, um, uh, producing graduates who've gone on to be MPs and chancellors and prime ministers. I think the whole kind of aura of these places, on top of the simple architecture of these places, um, teaches people how to be um, superior, how to act superior to others. Um, and I think, you know, in many ways, it's, it's a function of the British class system as well. You know, these people have, these kids have parents who are judges, lords, they are, you know, the cream of the crop, you know, as they would like to put it. Um, and so this just, this builds a sort of architecture around them, a framework, um, and also a social isolation. Like these places are campuses, kind of like mini Ivy League colleges, like they're boarding schools. They're not supposed to be in contact with the outside world. And I think because of that, um, that kind of breeds uh, an arbitrary resentment towards the working class, mm -hmm. which then they can form these societies in Oxford like the Bullingdon Club. And obviously the Bullingdon Club isn't quite as popular as it used to be because it's been exposed so much. But there are drinking societies at you know, Cambridge and at Oxford that provide a similar function that allow the, these kind of quite juvenile attitudes, like you say, um, quite pernicious attitudes to kind of thrive in a university setting before acting as a launch pad into the professions where people, like you say, they'll go to house parties where everybody owns a property when they've graduated these universities. They'll go and work at law firms where they only recruit from certain universities, certain classes of people, um, you know, whose fathers probably work for the law firm or similar law firms. You know, it is, it's like an institution. It's like the firm um, just on like a grand scale when you don't come from that background the image you have in your head of these people is that oh my god they're so much more sophisticated than me and I remember feeling that at uni I remember um uh, our head of department having a go at me because I didn't know Latin and I was like well Latin's a dead language do you know Bengali and he was like aha a hit a palpable hit and I don't speak Bengali either but he doesn't know that because I'm brown but it was this sense of like oh you guys have culture you have culture, you are breathing the rarefied air of culture and I don't have that. And I'm kind of scrabbling to get into it. But then actually what is exposed in this book, particularly in John Mitchison's um, forward is that it's not sophisticated. It's actually very animal and very crude and quite disgusting. Like, like what does that about? Like make that make sense for me yeah yeah i mean i think it's partly just like social training that we've like been shown this on like tv and in films that these people are the sort of high to sophistication and it's been amplified by instagram i think as well like you know the amount of videos of you know posh people going to santorini and you know the amalfi coast and that kind of thing it kind of it's a very two-dimensional form of sophistication where everything's pretty and nice and therefore that means that it's erudite and also smart and intelligent. It's And like you say, it's not. It's largely just um, like drinking culture just with more expensive booze. Like, that's it. Um, I can do that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's kind of, it's kind of ridiculous that it's been um, kind of placed into our social psyche that these people are 
better than everybody else. Um, I think as well, a lot of it is based around just greed. It's pure corporate greed. Like, um, I think the the whole base, and you see this with Boris Johnson, someone who, you know, uses Latin words. He likes to think of himself as sophisticated, former newspaper editor, um, you know, written multiple books. You know, this is his sense of self is his kind of, you know, his classical education, right? What's he most obsessed about having stopped being prime minister, apart from trying to get back into Downing Street? It's making money. It's literally just talking at the biggest banks, um, you know, some of the seediest institutions in the world, trying to make bank, like buying a Cotswolds manor house and just having like Gatsby-esque parties. Um, you know, at its raw form, it's just like who makes, like who wins is the person with the most money when they die. Like that's it at its most fundamental because that sustains the class. Um, and so I think that that breeds a kind of like a shallowness and a lack of a kind of anti- intellectual spirit. I mean, isn't, isn't that a kind of decline in status for the aristocracy? Because a hundred years ago, a man like Boris Johnson pops up, he'd be given the subcontinent to run. It's like, there you go. You've never been to this place. You've got nothing but disdain for, you know, the native population. Go run it, my son. Whereas now he's got to be like, oh, JP Morgan, can I have some of that lovely speaking fee? Like, isn't that kind of a fall from grace? Yeah, totally. And, um, it's re- it plays out really interestingly in Britannia Unchained, which is uh, Liz Truss, Dominic Raab, Quasi Quartang's tract, uh, Chris Skidmore as well, who's the the guy who made it out, so to speak. Um, like their whole thing is based around like, how do we revive empire? How do we like it? Li- like obviously, as you'd expect, it has like Britannia on the on the like front cover. You know, it's this whole thing of like. We used to be a colonial power and now we're not. And so what can we do to turn ourselves into a colonial power? And the whole thing is not based around like, we're doing this to provide for the wealth of the nation. Um, It's how do we provide for the elite? How do we ensure that we as the elite are the rulers of the world again? And yeah, it's that that entire mentality. And um, Simon Cooper writes it in... um, chums as well, this whole generation of people who went through Oxford in the 1980s, um, they kind of seen like their prep schools decline. Da- David Cameron's prep school um, infamously closed soon after he went there, not because of his exploits, but just because there wasn't enough demand um, for it. Um, and I think there was this real palpable sense of national decline during that period um, and then revival you know, revival of the aristocracy through Thatcherism. Um, and I think after having graduated these institutions, they put in place policies that have um, tried to reclaim that sort of colonial spirit again. But like you say, it, it, never re- it never really works. It's always subservient to something else now in the modern world. Like we like trashed our industrial base um, and in order to prop up the pound, we basically needed other exports. And our other exports have been finance and have been the property sector. So we've basically let London and our major cities be bought up by the oligarchs of the East. And they've become a new power structure. The oligarchy has sort of surpassed the aristocracy in a way because the aristocracy has used the oligarchy to try and propel its standing to a previous era of dominance, which is just really clutching at straws. I mean, this is the... Oliver Bullough's um, Butler of the World theory, which is that the British aristocracy has this huge global cultural status, which is, you know, a remnant of its time as an imperial power, but it doesn't have the financial heft to back it up anymore because we don't have an empire. But what we can do is sort of go, all right, we'll be the butler to your money. We will give you the sort of cultural cachet of our public school system and Oxford and, you know, be the sort of gateway into legitimacy for new money. Like we'll take the smell off the new money, but you know, let us get some crumbs for your table. Like, is that something which you've observed through your own work as an investigative journalist? Yeah, definitely. Like, um, and it's a shame really that the the Russia's invasion of Ukraine only kind of brought this to a head because it's been happening for decades and people it's it's really flown under the under the radar. Um the stories, you know, in there of like um, Boeing full 
planes of kids being ferried back and forth from St. Petersburg every summer to like, you know, London's poshest private schools. Um, I mean, famously now, the golden visa system was kind of, the, like you say, the gateway for the oligarchs where they could essentially, the idea of the golden visa was that um, you could expedite a visa and even citizenship in the UK if you invested or you pledged to invest enough money in the UK. So you could get like, you get citizenship in like two years if you invested 10 million quid, for or promised to invest 10 million quid um, in the UK. And there were like no due diligence checks on where this money was coming from. It was like, um, like we just stuck our heads in the sand as a nation and let oligarchs, not just from Russia, but from, you know, Gulf states to flock over here and basically camp in London, clean their money, um, inflate property prices across the country because we needed a way of propping up the pound. And like you say, ensuring that we had some sort of kind of USP in the modern world. And London grad was the way, was like the way to do it. Um, and it's, a, it's another thing that I kind of, it just baffles me in the wake of the war in Ukraine is that the golden visa system has now been like shut down. It just seems to be an admittance that it was like really dodgy to start off with. Um, but now Rishi Sunak wants to fly out MBS from mm. Saudi Arabia and get chummy with him when like this guy's perpetuating wars in the Middle East is, you know, Saudi Arabia's bombing Yemen. Um, he's, he's, yeah, he's cut from a similar sort of cloth. I'm not saying exactly the same cloth, but similar sort of cloth to Vladimir Putin. Um, the likes of the UAE and Qatar have literally been invited to invest 10 billion quid a year, sorry, 10 billion quid in total in priority industries. And this, this is going on while we're saying we can't have China investing in our primary infrastructure because it's a national security risk. It's like the contradictions of the British state in relation to oligarchy, just like, like tires in knots. But there's also the way in which this does get an element of popular buy-in when you've got UAE or Saudi Arabia buying up football clubs. I mean, it really was like the Gulf Monarchies derby this weekend, Man City versus Newcastle United. And not that there's any such thing as clean money in sports, I'm not naive, but there was such celebration when the Saudis came in to do their buyout of Newcastle United because the thing that it promised for people who are fans of the club was, okay, we're going to restore pride. We're going to put money into this team. You're going to feel good about yourselves again. I mean, how does it make you feel when you see that kind of like big buyout of like, you know, local assets, treasured local assets like football teams? Yeah. I mean, the thing to say as well is that this all, this all happened um, was facilitated by the British government. So it tried to hide its role in the Newcastle sale, but essentially at a very high level, like up to the foreign secretary, they were trying to make this happen. They were, you know, organizing meetings for Saudi Arabia to buy this club. So the British state is like, it's, it's part of this moral failure. It's like at the center of this moral failure. I think the thing is that like, as a football fan, I see why there's jubilation on the part of fans. And I think that football is such a national institution in a way that sadly kind of politics is not that I can see why this is happening. Like people value um, the success of their football club, rightly or wrongly, way more than they value who's going to be in power the next general election. And that's just a general social issue that we've got to wrestle with one way or another. Um, well, there's some degree of accountability in football. If the manager doesn't deliver, he gets sacked. If a uh, prime minister doesn't deliver, he gets elected again. I mean, you can't get, rid of, can't get rid of the ownership though of a football club, really. I mean, maybe if the government brings in its, you know, fan, you know, you know, fans on boards and that sort of thing, we might get a degree of balance. But even still, um, like you can't, you're not going to unseat the Saudis or UAE, really, um, if you're a fan. Um, I think. The, the the problem is that it's kind of like um it's like a gateway drug really the buying of football clubs like it allows good pr for these like gulf states these petro states these you know like essentially dictatorships to then squat really in local areas you've seen it in manchester there's been a huge buy up of property and assets in manchester 
by the United Arab Emirates following their purchase of Manchester City Football Club. It's essentially a second state within Manchester. And I've no doubt that Saudi Arabia will try to do the same in the Northeast. And again, this is sanctioned by the British government. The British government um, following the 2019 election and Boris Johnson's, Johnson's promises to level up, um, it said, yeah, we'd love, to, well, theoretically love to do that because we want to win the next election, but this is going to cost a shitload of money. Who's got a load of money? Petro states. And so they've basically ushered in these, you know, these people with horrific human rights records um, as a way of fulfilling that leveling up promise. Like Teesside, free ports, like that's a big engine for the this sort of investment. Often in dodgy, like greenwashing projects like hydrogen, carbon capture, etc. Um and so I kind of, I worry about like local capture as much as anything. I think like London to a large degree is beyond the point of return with the amount of kind of oligarch capture that we've got. Um, and I just, yeah, the big thing for me is not seeing kind of a domino effect of other places in the UK fall into the same sort of cycles as London, you know, housing problems, only luxury housing being, being built, no social housing being built, like- Poor doors. Poor, exactly, poor doors, um, sky pools, like, you know, the country's unequal enough without then an extra layer of elite oligarchs being added and dragging it further towards, you know. I mean, how does this square with, you know, Brexit? You know, 52% of the electorate voted for Brexit and whether you were a left-wing Brexit voter or a right-wing Brexit voter, you were united in wanting to bring some sem some semblance of control and sovereignty back to this particular national population. Uh, the same people who were campaigning for Brexit are also the same people who've been the midwives of this massive sell-off of local and indeed national assets to foreign powers. Mm. How do they get away with it? This is the thing is that I always thought that this would kind of um, be the undoing of the Brexit project, so to speak, is the kind of national populism of well, that's articulated by like UK, like old UKIP, like it's like kind of leftish economically, or at least pretending to be, and then quite right wing socially, um, which Boris Johnson kind of epitomised. He tried to do that as well. That was kind of the, the square he tried to hospitals, but not for migrants. That kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, exa exactly, exactly, um, and then the kind of intellectual, not intellectual, ideological kind of forefathers of this movement, the likes of Jacob Bruce morgan Daniel Hannan, Douglas Carswell, etc., um, who have an obsession with libertarianism, which is basically, you know, burn the state, free market, um, let's appeal to, you know, the, the developing economies of the world and get them to invest in this country, etc. And, you know, you, you kind of saw it with Liz Truss, actually, because she was that she was the kind of wet dream of libertar of Brexit libertarianism. Was it um, Airbnb, Uber riding freedom fighters? Exactly, like <laughs> Deliveroo Britain. It's like <laughs> it's like a real and, and it and it just disintegrated on contact with you know economic reality for one, which is like hugely ironic, and um, but also you know on contact with the electorate. You know what would have happened to the Conservative Party? if Liz Truss would have led them into a general election. They would have been wiped out, right? So actually people don't identify themselves by their depression takeaways. You know what I mean? Like there are values that we hold more dear than like, you know, a pad thai winging its way to me in 15 minutes. Completely. And I think, I mean, a lot of, the, a lot of these people who've been on the libertarian wing have like vested financial interests in this like... Uh, outreach strategy, for want of a better term, to the East. Like Jacob Rees-Mogg, like, is an investment manager, um, formerly with Somerset Capital, who've got massive, like, investments in developing economies. Like, he sees the world through that prism of, like, these countries have got mad growth, Britain doesn't, we're going to try, we're going to have to tie ourselves to them to make it work. Oh, right, they're developing economies, so their regulations aren't quite as good. Right, so we're gonna have to we're gonna have to lower those. Oh yeah, food standards aren't that good. We'll lower those as well because ultimately we just want growth to be able to splash the cash on the things that we enjoy. And you know, the workers they'll have to fight for their supper, but they'll have, they've done that for generations. It's like a Dickensian view of Britain, like merged with 
like techno oligarchy. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, it's pretty miserable. I mean, do you think that it's institutions like the Billington Club or like boarding schools that mean that individuals like Jacob Rees-Mogg or Boris Johnson, they don't see the humanity of the people that they're meant to govern or see the humanity of the people in developing countries who are the sort of, you know, human fuel for runaway growth. You know, they kind of view everyone else as NPCs. Yeah, completely. Yeah, yeah, completely. They're just sort of like, um, yeah, pawns on a, on a chessboard to kind of be moved around to the benefit of, you know, the, the aristocracy, the kings and queens, so to speak. Um, yeah, I, I think it's I think it's partly as well coming back to the kind of like greed, like neoliberal greed mindset of like growth is good, like that's it. That's kind of like the moral and economic touch point of modern society is that GDP growth of like two percent or more means a healthy nation, whereas it just like doesn't like and like I think that lots like. The Labour Party has had a problem with this recently as well and kind of has a problem with it currently that it's focused more on growth than redistribution. But um, the kind of G Jacob Rees-Mogg, Boris Johnson mindset takes it to its like absolute conclusion, like you say, which is um, that, you know, we can, we can grow. It's kind of growth at the expense of others rather than inclusive growth. Um, the selling off of, yeah, common spaces, um, the decimation of public services, etc. cetera. Um, in, if that facilitates growth, then in their worldview, it's logical, rational, economically sensible and moral. Um, and yeah, obviously the bullying club mentality, this kind of, these circumstances, this like gilded club that they've been um, carried through all of their lives, the silver spoon existence, helps them to not see like, either the economic advantages or the moral necessity of providing for the population as a whole rather than a substrand of society. I mean, uh, this was one of the things that I found quite interesting about the book. And maybe if I have a criticism of the book, it would be this, which is you think about the person who, you know, drove through the neoliberal consensus in this country, it's Margaret Thatcher. And whatever else she was, she wasn't wasteful and she wasn't feckless and she wasn't hedonistic as an individual. And yet, undeniably, her economic policies led to the destruction of whole communities in this country that have never, recover have never recovered. You've never had certain parts of the North and the Midlands recover from deindustrialization. We haven't recovered from becoming so dependent on the financial sector of our economy. We haven't recovered from the kind of atomization and competition and the loss of you know communal bonds from the Thatcher era. So how does the existence of Margaret Thatcher square with the Bullingdon Club thesis of you have to be socialized into this mindset to carry out this kind of economic policy? Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's a completely fair point. I think that um the thing about Thatcherism is that she had a resentment towards the working class. Um you know, the, and and actually the aristoc less so the aristocracy, but certainly resentment towards the aristocracy. She was sort of like the bully pulpit for middle class interests. Like she was absolutely single minded about representing the interests of like the small business owner, but at the expense of everybody yeah, else's daughter society. of a grocer. That yeah, was her big thing. Exactly, and she punched in like both directions to kind of fulfil that aim. Right, I, I think the. The way in which this is manifested post Thatcher is really interesting because I think that like the aristocracy, as I, as I mentioned earlier, was kind of getting battered a bit, during, even during the 1980s. It was the yuppie era. It was like supposed merit meritocracy. You know, private schools were getting shut down. Like there was a real trend against um, like old Etonianism in government. She famously got rid of like the old guard of old Etonians. It was all about grammar school grafters. But... The aristocracy, like, it kind of sounds like a conspiracy, but not conspiracy theory, but a conspiracy. As in, like, I think essentially what happened was the aristocracy said, right, well, Thatcher has created a system in which organized labor has been smashed, in which um, power and money can be concentrated in a few firms, monopolies can develop. And that's completely within our class interest. 
So they essentially took the tenets of Thatcherism, which were premised on like this middle class, um, you know, die hard attitude, and used it to their own benefit in order to um, kind of uh, revive the fortunes of the aristocracy. Um, and it's really interesting. Um, one of the Saatchi brothers, I forget which one, but it's quoted in the book, um, gave an interview to the Times recently. And obviously the Saatchis did Thatcher's advertising in the 80s, uh, the Conservative Party's advertising in the 80s. And he said Thatcher would have hated what her policies created because she would have seen the sort of techno monopolies that have been created in the modern world as bad as like excessive state power. Like she was, you know, theoretically in favor of competition and like you say, graft and merit. And actually the outcome of her policies were like the revival of the aristocracy, monopoly power, state capture by private institutions um, that have um, a specialism for procuring government contracts above anything else, like a lack of competition in the market. Like her, like, and Sachi's kind of implying that she would be like more left-wing now than she actually was back then. So I kind of think that Thatcher created the kind of perfect like breeding ground for the aristocracy um, kind of unknowingly in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just been exploited like by the Bullingdon Club elite. I mean, you, you use the word conspiracy and it made me think of the fact that something you'll hear an awful lot from you know, legacy media journalists, particularly, you know, from the BBC and the Times is that they always say, cock up is much more likely than conspiracy. And when you try and say, well, something has been designed this way, or it's a product of coordinated activity, they make you sound like you've got a tinfoil hat on your head. Where do you stand on the cock up versus conspiracy thing? Yeah, I mean, I think that often things are cock up because like, people in power so stupid like you certainly can't discount it as a theory <laughs> um given like recent evidence as well but i mean i think the the like the crystallization of this was the cronyism corruption democracy whatever you want to call it during the pandemic whereby um tory donors literally called up their mates in government and got contracts like we have the receipts we we know now that like, for example, won't name names because don't want to get us sued, but like a Tory MP who was consulting for a particular private firm called up, well, sorry, emailed Matt Hancock um, in order to encourage Matt Hancock um, to commission COVID tests from this particular firm. Um, and then Matt Hancock passed on this inquiry from the MP immediately to his officials. Like we know Lord, Lord Bethel, who was kind of at the crux of um, the uh, Department of Health's procurement during the pandemic, he stood up in the Lords fairly early on during the pandemic and was questioned about these contracts that had been awarded to um, Tory mates and donors. And he openly said, it's like on the record, it's in Hansard, he said, we used informal arrangements to procure contracts. Like, no, no, like sugarcoating it. Like he literally says that, you know, we used our contact book to get the supplies that we needed at that particular time. They're not saying that cronyism didn't happen. They're saying that it was justified given the circumstances, right? And so you just, it's been laid bare, like how this actually happens at the top of government, how Tory donors like have a direct line to ministers. Like open democracy has done, Peter Gagan in particular has done, brilliant reporting on this in recent years, um, showing how the Conservative Party has created a structure, like a Patreon structure, right? Where if you're a donor, you get certain privileges. And those privileges aren't like, oh, uh, I don't know, like you get a grand piano or something. Like, <laughs> it's like you get a seat in the Lords. You get like, yeah, I mean, like, like more than 50% of people who've donated a million and a half to the Conservative Party have been given peerages. Like, coincidence? <laughs> like, come on. Um, but like, so there's like, there's like levels to do Tory donorship. And what you get is you get more access the higher you go up. So the leaders group, which you have to donate 50 grand a year to be part of, you get like 
kind of like a like a like social status within the Conservative Party. You can mingle at dinners with ministers, etc. And then the more you ramp up, the kind of tighter the circle gets, and the more policy focused um, your advice becomes. And that gets to such a level for quarter of a million pounds, where during the pandemic you could be part of a Downing Street advisory board which was chaired by Boris Johnson's chief of staff, where you got direct access to the prime minister, um, to ministers, senior officials, to lobby them about policy, not just to chat to them and kind of have a a word in their ear about a particular development that you might want to be approved because it would benefit you, but literally like COVID policy, these people were being asked to like give their expertise on. It's basically, it's cash, it's cash, it's a Monday cash for access system. The irony, the irony of you, I agree, there's like a general kind of like snobbery from the press, like, uh, you know, the, the mightier than thou, like kind of media establishment, um, you know, of those who report about these things or at least shout about them. But that story about the Downing Street Advisory Board was reported by the Sunday Times, was exposed by the Sunday Times, right? So they got this weird thing where they love to break the story but they're not willing to consider what this actually means systemically. And I think that's where it falls down. Often they have good journalists, but they have really poor like systems of explanation of how this operates and why it happens. Because I was thinking about a time I was on Politics Live not that long ago, and we were discussing a story like this. It might have been something like Second Jobs, it might have been something like Procurement, but basically it was about there being an uncomfortably close relationship between big money and politicians. And I said, this is corruption operating in plain sight. And I got slapped down by Joe Coburn. And it was like, you can't say that. But why not? If it was Bangladesh we were talking about and we were describing the exact same dynamics, people would have no problem describing it as corrupt. So why is it that the uh, custodians of our information ecosystem are so reluctant to use the word corruption? It's really interesting because on top of that, the public thinks it's corruption. The, the public think that politicians are all in it for themselves. And often that's like an unhealthy attitude, but in many ways it's true, right? And like they've seen it repeatedly over the years. So the, the custodians of our public conversation are out of step with both political reality and public sentiment, which is a really bad place to be in. Um, but I mean, there's a very simple explanation for this, which is that the very people who are at the top of the media clique are part of this like corrupt, chummy system, like the whole lobby system. And there are some really good lobby journalists, don't get me wrong. And again, this is a thing about individuals versus systems, like the systems are the important thing. The whole lobby system is based around access to power The lobby literally describes the place in Westminster where journalists can hang out, can chat to MPs, can get gossip. Um, And then often the stories are kind of like anonymized. So they chatted to an MP or or a minister and they'll be described as a Sunak ally or a former Boris Johnson minister. And it kind of gives this whole cloak and daggers like House of Cards feel to British journalism. Um, And that's just like, that's just the nature of it. Like, and as a result, you've got a system whereby those who are able to extract the most information from the most senior ministers are successful in the lobby system, which psychologically means that you're like, you're not going to call them out. You're not going to call out the same ministers who are giving you tips. Like you're just, you're just trained because of the system to do that. And then you've got on top of that, you've got, you know, the sort of uh, monopolistic ownership of these media titles by you know, we all know the names, you know, Murdoch, et cetera, um, Rothermere, and now increasingly, you know, like Paul Marshall um, at GB News and Legatum, the Legatum Institute, where like, you know, they're very rich men, like with certain economic interests, like they're going to like, lead, well, not even lean, because, you know, I haven't seen the inside of these institutions. Like I've worked for the BBC, but I've not like, work for like the times for example but like it would seem baffling to me if murdoch doesn't hire editors who he likes who he thinks are going to follow his line so he may not lean on them there's plenty of reporting to suggest he does but even if he doesn't lean on them they just generally kind of create a system by hiring that like benefits the well it's also you don't buy a dog to bark yourself you know it's like you 
hire the editors who will take a certain line so you don't have to lean on them yeah. necessarily. Exactly. I mean, it's funny that you mention um, newspaper oligarchs and I don't want to get sued either, so I'm not going to be naming any names, but I've um, got a friend who who grew up in the rarefied, he grew up in the rarefied environs of Chelsea. So he's always telling me these insane stories from being a teenager, which for me is like, it's like, you know, listening to like, you know, the Real Housewives of Kensington. Like, it's just so bizarre to me the way these people grew up. And I didn't exactly have a sheltered upbringing, but there's like a level of extremity for the children of the rich, which I just find endlessly fascinating. He was telling me about um, um, the the son of a newspaper oligarch, either the son or the grandson, um, who if I said their surname would be very recognizable, who was bought a McLaren at the age of 17 and wrote it off, like repeatedly wrote off these supercars, you know, had a relationship to um, drink and drugs that if that was a working class, child you would be talking about failures of the parents crisis of morality um you know chavs violence this that the other and for me it was just this horrible realization that the norms which are used to police working class people those norms of behavior are not only absent when it comes to the children of the super rich, they would be seen as not being really one of the gang if they did abide by those norms of decency and morality and respect for other people. Yeah, completely. That's like the kind of social proving ground is how like <laughs> kind of, yeah, how like how well you can practice excess. Um, yeah, and get away with it. And also like they're just shielded from like consequence in that sort of system. Um, you just again like let's bang on about Boris Johnson because he's gone now thank god but um, you know a man who's repeatedly just like broken the rules both like professional personal democratic and just like oh happened to make his way into 10 Downing Street like epitomises that sort of attitude it's funny so like rule, like rule breaking and like journalistic like norms right I find it really interesting that these people are quite pious about when we talk about corruption and about systemic issues in British society and things like being, you know, governments acting in a way that just like kill people. Like they, they kind of shirk away from those kind of describing it in those kind of terms. Um, but in terms of like the papers that they work for, these newspapers have often acted in recent years as basically propaganda leaflets. Like they don't, or they haven't observed journalistic rigor in the way that they've covered certain stories. You know, the Times and the Sunday Times have generally been, you know, pretty good. Although, you know, it buried a story about Carrie Johnson and her, you know, past hiring by the Times or whatever. <laughs> uh, no, sorry, past hiring by the Foreign Office. Um, but like other other papers in that kind of like genre have like carried stuff because it's politically expedient to do so because it benefits their man like either Boris Johnson or Rishi Sunak like Currygate with Keir Starmer was like the classic and you forget there's just been such a slew of stories over the past few years that you kind of forget what happened which was essentially the 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 like mainstream press establishment fab like essentially fabricated a story or or exaggerated it to a ludicrous level put it on the front page day after day after day, you know, that speaks to political motivation, not journalistic uh, values. And so to come after other people and say that, you know, you're not, you know- Objective enough. You're not objective enough, exactly. Just smacks of gross hypocrisy. But I mean, when it happens to Keir Starmer, and rightly so, Everyone who is left of center from, you know, the wilderness of Navarra media all the way to the sort of lofty heights of the Observer comment section are united in condemning it and calling it out. So when Keir Starmer is being smeared as having, you know, um, shielded Jimmy Savile when he was, you know, director of public prosecutions or if Keir Starmer is being accused of scoffing an illegal curry, people are like, no, that's really, really bad. But when it came to Jeremy Corbyn, where I think we can agree as a matter of fact that there were stories which are just pure invention 
pure invention. Um, and that was something which was impacting him and other members of his shadow cabinet. The likes of The Guardian and The Observer didn't respond in the same way. They were like, oh, well, there's no smoke without fire and sort of joined in on the pylon. So isn't isn't there a bit of a problem here, which is when you do have this kind of failure of journalistic rigor, you've got sections of the liberal center who are happy to join in if the target is someone that's to the left of them. Yeah, completely. And I think we'll find actually that it's not just like on the economic spectrum that they that they'll like jump on the bandwagon. There's been quite a lot of pieces recently, and you might you know you might say that some of them are valid. So I generally think that they're not. That about like radical centrists. Like there's been a lot of like um, kind of like harsh criticism of those who've you know, economically and politically, they're still like finding their way, shall we say. But in terms of what they've realized in terms of like the scale of government corruption in these past few years, right? And calling out like um, snobbery and elitism, et cetera. And in fact, you know, calling out profiteering, you know, the center's actually getting more radical economically or has got more radical economically recently. But there's now... A de- degree of snobbery, even towards the likes of you know Alistair Campbell, James O'Brien, etc., from the the pious cen- centre ground media, um, where they're kind of like they're lambasted as like being, um, yeah, being subjective and being like hysterical, um, rather than those institutions kind of seeing what's happened. I mean, I'm really interested and fascinated by like what the moderate left explanation of Boris Johnson is, Mm. right? Because even Keir Starmer was there at the dispatch box, like lampooning Johnson about his, like, um, his his sense of impunity um, drawn from entitlement. Like that was some of Starmer's strongest stuff when he was stood at the dispatch box, just flaying Johnson about being an old Etonian and how he'd corrupted standards in democracy, right? So even when Keir Starmer's going for this quite like, you know... Um, kind of structural analysis of like it comes down to like how you're brought up and the institutions in which this occurs rather than just like Johnson being a bad apple right I'm really fascinated by how like moderate commentators explain how like what see, how that works see i i think I, I disagree with you here um so for me there's a distinction between the likes of jolly and mormon martin lewis who i think are liberals whose liberalism have taken them to more radical conclusions because they're following it all the way through and you can sort of see them following the chain of logic and following injustices and unfairness and then you go oh actually you end up sounding an awful lot more like a socialist than you did a few years ago but just still a liberal. And I draw a distinction between them and say the likes of Alistair Campbell, who may not have grown up with the same kind of um, Etonian impunity that Boris Johnson had. But if you want to talk about undermining democratic norms, if you want to talk about dishonesty, and if you want to talk about dirty money being funded by the Kazakh regime, um, you know, the Tony Blair Institute, its relationships with uh, the Kazakh regime or Saudi Arabia or Paul Kagame, they're just as bad as any of the Britannia Unchained lot in terms of the corrosion of our democracy, the hollowing out of our democracy and the selling off mm-hmm. to, you know, dirty money from abroad. But because they take the more liberal side of elite conflicts like Brexit, then it's like, ah, they have to be your allies. I mean, I I, I kind of think that Keir Starmer lambasting Boris Johnson, but having Tony Blair whispering in his ear isn't a structural analysis of what's going on. It's quite the opposite. It's a sort of vibes-based opposition to Boris Johnson, but not the substance of it. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I mean, there's like gross hypocrisy contained with all within all of this, especially because I think the both the media and actually the social media ecosystems kind of latch on to like big names who like can kind of transcend issues. So like Campbell was a voice on Brexit, then he was a voice on Boris Johnson, then he's a voice on corruption um, without like examining the substance behind it and the hypocrisies, etc., or allowing spaces for other voices, which I think is a real shame. Um I'd say that your criticism of Starmer is probably truer now, kind of retrospectively in a way, in in my view, than it was back then. Like when Starmer was doing all this, he, he seemed a bit more kind of 
like fluid in his like policy generation. Like they came out with loads of good stuff on like banning second jobs, reforming the democracy, you know, reaffirming the abolition of the House of Lords, um, creating like a government office for like procurement and corruption to like kind of like prevent any of that COVID stuff happening again. Um, and I think, you know, Rachel Reeves, who was in the cabinet office before, sorry, shadow cabinet office before she went to chancellor, um, was the kind of um, point person for criticizing the COVID corruption. And so I think that she's quite mindful, it seems, of those kind of like issues. My problem is that there's been a backsliding like in recent times, like it seems as though like Blair's got closer to Starmer. He's got even more, like Starmer's got even more rigid and kind of less like convinced that he's going to carry out those promises that were made during the Johnson era now that Johnson has gone. Um, you know, there's been all sorts of speculation about him stacking the House of Lords that he supposedly wants to abolish. Um, and you're probably going to say, well, that was inevitable, but, you know. No, not inevitable. I, I don't think anything's inevitable, but I think it was likely. Mm. Um, I mean, there's, it's something which you, you mention in the book when you're talking about this relationship between, um, you know, private corporations and government contracts that you mentioned that many of these seeds were planted under Blair when you think about private finance initiatives, the Carillion scandal, which now seems like a million years ago, that was planted in the sort of Blair era. Are, are you concerned that when you hear Keir Starmer or Wes Streeting talking about the need to involve the private sector in things like healthcare provision, um, you know, when you think about how well, how is that 28 billion of green spending actually going to be um, carried out? Are you concerned that it's going to be the same mistakes in terms of, you know, outsourcing the McKinseyification of, you know, government infrastructure projects? I think so. I, I yeah, I am concerned. One of the reasons that I'm not, and I'll get onto the reasons why I, I am in a second, is that Rachel Reeves actually was quite... Um, like the the Carillion collapse was quite a formative moment, like in terms of her like the her development of her politics. Um, so I think she might be one of the few guardrails against sort of you know the outsourcing culture that we've seen recently. Um, but I think the several reasons why I'm you know skeptical are that I mean one the effort to kind of extricate the state from these companies will be huge. These operations are formidable public affairs, like lobbying groups. They spend millions of quid every year ensuring that they get billions of pounds of government contracts. Like they're embedded within like every aspect of government policy from healthcare to immigration detention. Um, Child protection was one of the things that you pointed out in the book. Yeah, foster care. Like obviously we know the social care system is have, have like, basically, you know, wholly privatized. But the foster care system as well is like stocked full of private equity firms um, who make huge profits through it. It's like, and so I think you need a degree of boldness in order simply to tackle the state that we're in. Um, and I think, like you say, the general vibe from Labour is quite management consultancy-ish currently. Like, and that's, due to the kind of managerialism of Blair and, you know, how that has spawned through Starmer and his political vision is conservative, is rigid, is like, is it, you know, you know, no matter how, um, you know, sympathetic you are towards Starmer, he's not a visionary, right? And I think you need to be a visionary to basically make a massive institutional change to the way that the government operates, right? To separate state from corporations and um, because they're basically one and the same, now um so and then on top of that yeah like you've got all the kind of warning signs of talking about you know we're still going to outsource etc um so yeah i am and when the right-wing press puts pressure on starmer etc when they get into office um the tide's going to be they're going to be you know sailing into headwinds um and i'm not sure that he's got the sort of in ideological foundations, that kind of like purpose of politics that says, this is what I want to do. I want to ensure that, you know, we don't have state capture anymore and um, to like deliver on that. Like, 
wait to be convinced. Like, but yeah, I'm not that optimistic. I mean, if I could sort of, you know, probe into your brain a little bit. Um, for you, are these problems which are problems of neoliberalism, or for you, are these problems which are problems of capitalism? Like, where do you sort of sit politically with those things? Yeah, I mean, increasingly capital- <laughs> capitalism. <laughs> Probably started with neoliberalism and then, yeah, I mean, I think that wherever you turn currently, you see the problems of capitalism manifest. Um, like, you see it in terms of like, just the erosion of our like collective being in society, you know, like our like bonds with others are like eroded through austerity, through precarious employment, through like just the relationship that we have with the managerial system of capitalism. Um, you know, the erosion of public spaces in this culture in this country and the kind of decimation of working class culture. Like and without like, like those are like big things. And without kind of like that broad enough base to explain them, like I don't think you will explain them effectively. Um, like I'm increasingly of the belief that neoliberalism will consume whatever tries to like temper it. Mm. Like I think there's got to be a really like radical, bold counterbalance to neoliberalism in order to achieve radical social democracy in this country of like, I mean, I, like I went out to like rural Netherlands last year to visit their poorest region, um, Hronigen. Supposedly the poorest part of the country, great social housing embedded within the fabric of the town, not just kind of placed mm. at an inconvenient spot. Um, good tra public transport. Amazing public transport. Like community spaces, they've built the forum in the middle of mm. the city that's like this 10 story like leviathan to like culture like you can go see cinema there's like a library there's like a childcare sp space and it's just like free and open to like everybody um like urban planning is brilliant out there um i sound like i'm being paid by the the local government but yeah it can be like mark rutter's just been like operating like, yeah <laughs> sure <laughs> If they want to offer me citizenship, I'm not going to tell you Um I can flee here. Um, but yeah, and, and then like, I think partly that's because of like the strength of local government out there, uh, like really getting a grip on like not allowing corporate capture in the way that we've allowed in this country. Like when there is a partnership between state and the market, the state is the primary, is the dominant partner. Um, you've also not had the kind of like oligarch effect out there that you have in this country. So they're kind of immune to it for the time being. Um, but like in order to achieve that kind of like semi-idyllic, at least compared to our standards, social democracy, like we we have to go through a radical like readjustment in our political, like in our policies and our political thinking. Um, and I think that requires some pretty like, yeah, some pretty tough policies. How has climate factored into all of this for you? Because, you know, a lot of your work for DSmog is looking at how um, fossil fuel corporations are warping our media environment, mm. are, are warping our sense of what is going on with the climate crisis and also what the solutions to the climate crisis are. Um, how has um, doing this kind of work changed your own um, political outlook? Yeah, I mean... <sighs> I think in some ways it's, you know, broadened my political outlook, but it also fits into the same kind of patterns that I'd seen previously. Like everyone says that big o the big oil tactics are a replica of big tobacco, you know, um, and you see the ways in which big oil lobbies, you know, replicated across um, corporate life, you know, in order to water down regulations, you know, infamously, you know, the financial sector. Um, and the amounts that it donates to the, the political parties, particularly the Conservative Party, um, in order to create this narrative that we simply wouldn't survive without the City of London. Um, but big oil's just got like way more money to do it. And obviously the effects of that are ecologically, you know, catastrophic. Um, I've also, also seen, you know, the same, for, and we'll see this increasingly, the same forces of populism 
that were advocating for Brexit and were misinforming people around Brexit now turning their guns to climate change. And some of the same individuals like Steve Baker, for instance. Literally the same, Farage. Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely the same. Like Jacob Rees-Mogg. Yeah, they're just like, they've seen, they see, I think, climate change as a way in which the left has an opportunity to create a more interventionist state um, and to, you know, deliver redistribution and the Green New Deal and create green jobs for left behind communities. And like you say, despite the promises of Brexit, despite the sort of, you know, the leveling up mantras, um, they don't like it because it's not libertarian um, because, you know, it's, it's going to be bad for the corporate interests that they predominantly serve, you know, whether that's because they just have a mindset, a conservative, you know, economic mindset or whether because, you know, they have close financial ties to those institutions. Um, so essentially, like, I think climate change will soon emerge through the same structures, the same frameworks that we've perceived other problems recently and will become like kind of the defining battleground of politics, like in the not too distant future. Uh, and you're going to have this quite dangerous like alliance of elite populist politicians who've been emboldened by Brexit, whose views are carried onto the airwaves by oligarch-owned newspapers, whose ideologies, if you can call them that, are supported by corporate money. Um, you know, the biggest corporate money that we could possibly see, that you could possibly imagine, you know, the profits that Shell and BP are making um, amid the cost of living crisis gives them, you know, huge reserves to be able to devote to public affairs. Um, and they're doing it in really subtle ways. I mean, in particular, like I said earlier, promoting false solutions to the climate crisis. Carbon capture technology, which hasn't even really been invented yet. No, it's not been tested at scale. Like <laughs> it's it's like, it's bogus. Like hydrogen, exactly the same. Like lots of people promoting hydrogen because guess what? You have to use um, fossil fuel infrastructure to create hydrogen. Like they just don't want to go out of business. Um, and it's a really like, because we don't have like our antennas like tuned yet, the, or the public doesn't generally, it's like really easy for them to slip these false solutions in. I mean, not to sound like a, a technological determinist, but actually I think I'm increasingly a little bit of a technological determinist. Is part of this because the solution to the climate crisis fly in the face of rentierism, this idea of, you know, we're, we're renting all the things we need off of the people who own them. Because let's say that I want to have a, a totally decarbonized house. The things I would need are insulation, an air or ground source heat pump and solar panels on my roof. Now, those are all things that I have, right? That they're mine. You can't turn it off at the tap, right? Unless you have that kind of like crazy kidnapping software that like, you know, the line bikes have. Um, but basically I would have them. Whereas, you know, the model of rentierism, that is the basis of our energy production in this and every other fossil fuel dependent country. Like, is it that actually the solution to the climate crisis the things that we need and that, and that we've got the possibility to have, it just drives a coach and horses through the basis of the economy that we've got. Yeah, completely. And flies in the face of like a city of London led economy. Like I think in, in many ways, the Green New Deal like freaks people out, freaks like corporations out because it's promising a revival of industrialism, potentially unionism, mm. you know? We can only hope, <laughs> but you know, even even the spectre of that, I think, kind of um, produces produces fear. Um, and the whole idea of the Green New Deal is, you know, that you'd have you'd have it combined with devolution. You'd have stronger local leadership. So even if it wasn't owned, uh, you know, an, a, at an individual level, it would be at least kind of controlled or sculpted by local or regional governments, um, which scares Westminster, scares the banks. Um, and yeah, like you say, it it, it jeopardizes the rent the rentier economy that people of the corporations have grown so used to. Um, but I mean, I think it's it's just it's basic profiteering. It's just like these these firms, like the likes of Shell, like just do not have a simple financial interest to divest. And until like we either smash their mode of production. Or like 
we encourage them, I don't know how, to like divest. Like we're gonna be we're gonna be stuck in no man's land. Um I mean, it's, it bonkers to me when you mentioned the insulation thing. Like, that is one of the most basic things that could have brought people's energy bills down, um, you know, stopped energy leakage in people's homes, you know, made us, like, greener, leaner, more efficient. <laughs> like, surely that's something that the libertarian state wants, like, efficiency, like... Um, the way in which... And it kind of epitomizes the way in which ordinary people have been sort of sacrificed on the altar of corporate profits mm. because it's been like the state could have done this it had the money to do this um it was going to do this and then david cameron cr- cut the green crap um and didn't do this um which has meant that literally thousands and thousands of thousands of pounds are leaking out of people's windows into the pockets of shell and bp like you can't imagine a more rigged economic system than that um and i think as with all things like Britain being the heart of, you know, in many ways, still the heart of like capitalism, you know, financial culture, like the amount of dependency that we have on those firms um, and their role politically, both in terms of lobbying and donations, et cetera, means that it's a bind that we're going to find, as I was mentioning earlier, we're going to find very difficult to break out of and it will take radicalism to to do it like popular radicalism and the country's the country's like the country supports it the country sees how bonkers it is that it's paying for the profits of these companies there's nothing like anti electorate about <laughs> this it's very squarely like left populism like should just be should just be done like with boldness with the courage to do it i mean just to wrap up by looping back to the beginning of the discussion which is you've got this class of people who have been responsible for the ransacking of our country, either because they've done it themselves or they've allowed corporations on oligarchs to do it um, because it's, you know, beneficial for their class to do so. When you think about these individuals, do you feel the emotion of hate for them? No, I don't. I don't actually. And I think it's quite important not to, um, you know, as much as we were talking about like objectivity and journalism, um, you know, you do have to kind of, with any story, you know, do an investigative journalism. If merely to prevent getting sued, you <laughs> need to come at it with a degree of like, what's factual, what's not, like, take my emotions out of it. It's it's often what you can prove rather than what is actually the case. And to have that, you've got to, I think, have a clear sense of like who your targets are, like who the bad guys are, so to speak, or the people causing the problems in society. Um so you've got to have that, I think, moral basis to do your journalism or else, like, why are we journalists in the first place? But you've also got to have a clarity of thought to know when you're stretching the boundaries of plausibility mm-hmm. too far. Um, so, no, I mean, I like I don't I don't feel I don't feel hate for them. Um, I just like feel. Yeah, I just feel sad about like the state of the country, really, it sounds like quite like. I don't know, idealistic, but like you can, you literally just go abroad and things are so much better. They're less corrupt, they're less extractive. Um, and I'm like, why just, why can't we be like that? And it's just about shifting those blockades to like that sort of society being created. And often those are individuals standing in the way. So you've got to, yeah, you've got to target them. Sam Bright, thank you so much for joining me. Pleasure.